It's the Oatly Academy Artcast episode 101. Interview with animation art director Ryan Carlson, part two. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Artcast by the Oatly Academy of Visual Storytelling. I'm Chris Oatly, director of the Oatly Academy and your host. I was a character designer and visual development artist at Disney, and now I teach full-time and produce this show where I help you make a living from your own imagination. Find more art and story podcasts from some of the most inspiring voices in animation, games, kids' books, VFX, and comics at oatleyacademy.com forward slash shows. In the previous episode, we met Ryan Carlson, my Disney mentor and the person without whom the Oatly Academy may never have happened. Now in part two, Ryan talks about working on the Iron Giant and what he learned from Brad Bird, his advancement from assistant effects animator to art director, how to lead a team of creative professionals well, and the greatest gift an aspiring animation artist can give to an art director. And the 100th episode celebration continues after the interview. I'll play a segment from a behind the scenes panel discussion that we recorded with the Oatly Academy team members last year. So if you would like to know more about how we make the show and get to know many of the amazing people who work on it, be sure to stick around after the interview with Ryan. And be sure to watch the ArtCast feed. We are about to open early bird registration for our visual development workshop, First Flight how to create your new career in visual development. In fact, I think we will have early bird registration ready by the next episode of the ArtCast. Space is limited, so you'll want to jump right on it as soon as uh, registration opens. Okay, here is part two of my interview with Ryan Carlson, followed by the -the behind-the-scenes panel discussion with the Oatly Academy team members who make the art cast. So San Jose State, uh-huh. some, some good artists that come out of there. Yeah. Yeah, really some real strong work. Yeah. Uh, were you aware that, um, that that was special? Were you aware that it was a particularly strong school in terms of art? No. And was there a point at which you realized that? Or did you just kind of fire out of the canon of graduation? I just kind of fired out of the canon of graduation and then, and looking back, it's just, um, the the heads of the program, Bunny and Courtney, were just really great, great instructors and really amazing. And then their team that also, John Clapp and David Chai and some of these others that Jeff Jackson are, again, just phenomenal teachers and are also steeped in art and art history right. that they really encourage and inspire yeah. a lot of artists yeah. and are able to tap into those talent and channel them yeah. I think to create some really amazing yeah. students and, and talent too that then come out and enter the workforce and, be, and their programs in a way structured to uh, prepare you know, artists for the real world and so, was Iron Giant your first gig? Iron Giant was the first movie that I was on. So and I started as. What was the amount of time between graduation and getting that gig? Like a week. Oh wow! I well, didn't I realize mean, it was that fast. I mean, it was. It was actually actually it was less than that because one of my professors from San Jose State worked down in L.A. and he was a, a cleanup artist and had a lot of. And he was um, our life drawing instructor up at San Jose State. And he would fly up every Friday from L.A. to teach life drawing. 
and um, his name was Sheldon Bornstein, and he um, he's a good friend of mine, and was um, well became good friends later on, but. He actually was the one who got me the job on Iron Giant. He knew the okay. recruiter and knew they were looking for cleanup artists and um, used actually saw the talent in a few of us and used his clout kind of to wow. get us our first job on Iron Giant. Wow. So I started in effects, doing effects in betweening. Another impossible challenge. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, it was interesting because I had never done right. effects, I had never done like how to do tones on 2D characters, which right. is just painting in the shadows and things like that. And I mean, I did get yelled at quite a few times. Okay. I broke like a thousand dollar desk, the, you know, the first week I was at Warner Brothers. And I mean, it was, you know, it was like a rough start, but mm. it was an invaluable experience because um, some about learning effects and effects animation taught me um, how to think abstractly yeah. because it wasn't always about you know, pretty drawings and just motion and how things move and flow right. and different shapes move and progress yeah um, and change velocity like it, that that's yeah some, i did a little bit of effects animation and, and that was the thing that always drove me bonkers trying to keep track of like with water would like shatter and then there's things that will slow down yeah and then speed up and that kind of it's just crazy it's right crazy. yeah um you, I, I look back on a lot of that stuff now, and when I was first learning, I was trying really hard to keep track of every little drop and every right. little thing, and you know, it's drawing the arcs out between like yeah. how everything would move and stuff. And then I realized, you know, and it actually didn't click until this last movie I was on, and I was actually doing the effects design for right. the movie. Mm -hmm that it doesn't matter about all those little things. It's just the bigger shapes. Because when you read it in motion, it all, as long as it just, it all moves and it, you know, feels like water, each little drop, if you try and track every single little one, it's gonna, it becomes mechanical. Right. But if you just kinda, it, there is a, a sort of the randomness that's yeah. okay to being built into things like effects. Yeah. Uh, as long as it's the abstraction of the shape and stuff moving. Now, sometimes you do have to really super design out your effects. I think Hercules, you know, they really designed out yeah, those yeah. effects, and so they were tracking a lot of that stuff. But um, I don't think the particles were as small, though. Probably not. Yeah, no. probably much more visible, I would yeah, think. Yeah. I have to go back and watch it now. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I just, that was great, and, you know, Everybody still now is like, wow, you worked on Iron Giant? Right. That was, it's like they build you up in, this, in their minds. It's right. like, oh my God, you worked on the Iron Giant. Right. And it's like, yeah, why? Well, it's like an effects in betweener, man. Right. I was like the lowest of the low. I was yeah. like 800 bucks a week just, wow. you know, cranking stuff out, living in this crappy little apartment. Yeah. But I had a lot of fun yeah. on that production. Yeah. I mean, and I still remember, you know, Brad Bird was an amazing director to work yeah. with because he knew that movie down to the frame. Wow. And knew exactly what he wanted, and it was really inspiring. And, and it was a great, you know, I was very fortunate and blessed to have that start right. because it just showed me, it's like, wow, this could be phenomenal. I mean, this is going to be cool. This is going to yeah. be interesting, you know? So. Did it, you read the script? Did you know how good the movie was? Yeah. You no, know, I, wow. I was a little cog way back in the machine, wow. you know? Just uh, cranking away, just learning and, and failing and learning. And again, thankfully, some people, you know, like Sheldon took a chance on me and yeah. got me that job. And then, you know, other animators there took a chance on me and, and gave me more responsibility to do things. And I was learned a lot that way. And yeah. that kind of led then into like Disney, where it featured animation right after that. Went in work on Emperor's New Groove and ended up working with uh, a woman who again saw potential and yeah. took a chance on me and you know I got to learn more things than I would have if she hadn't been willing to do that. Just been very fortunate the people in my yeah. life that have done what they've done yeah. and I continue to remain friends with them and, yeah. and talk to them and run into them again in the industry yeah. right. years later and we're doing completely different things. Yeah. And, it's nice to look back, though, on those those first things like Iron Giant and like my friend John Bermudis, who's yeah. now had a you know a layout lead. And, He's been on the show before too. Oh, has yeah. he? Yeah, you know, it's just great. It's just like running back into each other again when we yeah. came back around at Disney, and yeah. it was just like, remember when we were doing this? Yeah. Remember, you know, and, and he did effects too, right? He was an effects animator on yeah. that, yeah. And then you worked with Brian Woodward. 
as well? Yes. Yeah. yeah. He was a, a, an effects he animator on that too, yeah. That's crazy. And so Disney Features was next. Disney Features was yeah, next. Two of my new... favorite animated films from my lifetime. Which, oh, Iron Giant yeah. and Emperor's New Groove? Yeah. I mean, top, the top two yeah. favorites. Amazing. Uh, so Emperor's New Groove through Home on the Range, which was the end of right. 2D animation at you know as a standard at feature yeah. animation. And were you doing effects the whole time? No, I was doing character cleanup there. Okay. I actually okay. went and applied at Disney. Uh, again, main, for, I think for for effects or cleanup or something like that. Yeah. And they're like, well, we're not going to hire you as an artist, but we'll hire you as into our trainee program. And it's like, you know, there's part of me that was like, well, wait a minute, I've already been on a movie. Right. You know, I should be. But, you know, again, going back to walk into every studio with your hat yeah. in your hands right. and... <laughs> It'd be accepting of what they're willing to give you and take this as a learning opportunity. And so I did that wow. and started their, their training program and was fortunate enough to be put under the tutelage of Renee Holt, who was basically the female lead cleanup artist for like um, all the, the, the female leads at, that's what she was known for, drawing beautiful women. So she, wow. uh, uh, from Ariel to Jasmine, Pocahontas, she was it's like if you want a beautiful girl you give it to Renee to, wow. to draw so I was thankful enough to get underneath her and um, she was the one who started you know saw the potential and gave me a lot of opportunity to to um, do other things than just the in-betweening I mean I, I, that was the majority of what I did but um, she did allow me to you know key out scenes and do other things learn other things and work on little side projects that the studio was doing that other artists didn't get the opportunity to do, so I'm eternally grateful for wow. for stuff like that. But it was there when I was at Feature Animation that um, Monsters, Inc. came out. Okay. And that was a turning point. That was a pivot point for me because I looked at what we were doing there at, at Feature Animation and realized that this is going to go bye-bye now. Yeah. CG has come to a point where it's so good that I need to change my skill set. Wow. I need to um, do something different if I want to stay in this industry because I'm, I can't keep doing cleanup. Yeah. Um, that's when I taught myself how to paint digitally. Right. Do now, you why the, painting? I went back to my illustration roots. You know, it was like what uh -huh. I had started with at San Jose. Where did you learn about digital painting? Just because you saw the background painters or something like that? I've seen the background painters. Um, I, I do like to draw and I like to paint, so... Maybe I'll you know, start doing this. I started messing around with it, doing drawings, scanning them into Photoshop, and, and learning how to paint that way. Just working on a tablet? Working on a tablet, yeah. yeah. And um, just started doing it, and then like showing my artwork around to other artists and the background painters there, and getting advice and tips from them. And wow. a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Chris Sonnenberg, mm -hmm. who is now. Um, he was at the time a rough in betweener, right. uh, basically assistant animator. Um, mm -hmm. He and I would take the train together and everything, but uh, he's like, oh, you know, I got this friend, Mike Kerinsky, down in backgrounds. Oh, man. You should just go, you should show him your work. Oh. So I went down and showed to him, and Mike, you know, gave me some great words of encouragement yeah. and it was really, uh, you know, nice and kind of showed me like what they did and, and their type of thing. And I'm like, that's something that's fun and yeah. that's interesting to me. And so, um, just continued to pursue it like there and now it's come back all the way around and now I've started at Sony and there's yeah. Mike Kerinsky yep. you know fresh off of production design of Hotel T2 and you know running into him again and it's just yeah. like wow you know and again he was just like oh yeah. my you're doing this now you're yeah. an art director now he's like wow I just he's like I never would have expected that yeah uh, also had another friend there who's an animator named Mike Disa uh -huh. you know he and I then did some little projects together. I'm trying to remember if that was the time we were on like Lilo and Stitch 2, and we ended up doing like a short, for, like the origins of Stitch for the beginning. Oh, cool. Before, a little short for that. I was very fortunate that he saw something in me that he wanted to keep connected with, and so I would do some, some sketches, drawings, little stuff for him. And then at that point, I went over to Nickelodeon. Right. And um, it was Stripperella. Oh my. So I was the, the character designer for that, and that's where I was first introduced into location design and how yeah. to start doing layout and things along with what I was doing with character design. And yeah. 
Um, Did you feel prepared? Not okay, at all. Can... <laughs> not at all. No, I had no idea what I was doing. I did, you know, I mean, I guess, I mean, in a professional sense, I right. knew what a character designer was oh, supposed sure. to, yeah, yeah. kind of supposed to do. Right. Do the, you know, design the character, do the turnarounds, do expression sheets, right. do, you know, different costume changes and things like that since it was a, a 2D, you know, thing. But how to exactly go through that process, I had no idea. Wow. But I knew that I was going to kill myself to learn yeah. this process that you know made me confident enough to at least to do it okay all right I just I can I can do this wow. but then there was a lot of nope nope yeah. nope 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 so failed a lot yeah but you know learned and then that just became better Crazy. for it so what came after stripperilla after that time, I was doing some development projects with, again, with Mike Disa, uh-huh. and he had landed at Disney Toon Studios, okay, and was working on the Tinkerbell movies. Mm-hmm. And what was he doing at that time? Storyboarding. Okay. And he was storyboarding on those movies, and um, and this is pre Pixar buyout, pre meltdown. Yes. Yes. This yeah. was years before. And he actually got me hooked up with the art director, Fred Klein, who needed somebody. They were transitioning. They knew they wanted the movie. They were going to originally make the movie hand-drawn and go through their Australian studio. But they decided to make it a CG movie. And so they needed someone to envision the characters in 3D. So they need someone to basically paint the girls. Right, yeah. Uh, And so I was brought in and... Painted the characters on how they would look 3D in uh, that is 3D crazy. form. Did you do the line art too, or was that Ritzko? No, uh, it's Ritzko, I think, that did all the, the line art. Yeah. Or um, Ryan O'Loughlin was oh, the director yeah. of the time, and so I think he had done some of the character design okay. work and stuff. Okay. So, you know, I would just, I basically went over their drawings, yeah. and they liked that, and, you know, I kept doing more of the characters and stuff. And at the time, DTS was kind of, before the Pixar buyout and everything was yeah. run by a woman named Sharon Morrill, uh, she decided she didn't like the art director anymore and said, give me the guy who's been painting the girls like this and hired me as the, the art director. Wow. And again, I walked into that job not knowing anything Wow. about art direction or anything how to do it and basically walked in my first morning and without going to my office first or anything sat down in a conference room and had a conference call with the Indian studio who was going to be making the movie. Oh my God. What, do you remember what that meeting was about by any chance? Like what you were expected to... I was expected to comment on water and how the, 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 um, their water dynamics were working. It's and a running it theme. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that was it. Was again thrown right into the fire. Feet, you know, wow. um, again, thankfully, I was at the time paired with another art director who had a lot more experience, named Carol Police. Oh, sorry, love Carol. Uh, she was fresh off Bambi Two, okay, and had a lot of experience. An incredibly wonderful, gifted, yeah. sweet lady. Beautiful movie too. Yeah. Good. Yeah, God. and uh, so she and I paired up. And we worked together, and she was incredibly patient with me wow. and taught me how to do everything and um, taught me her process and workflow and everything. And wow. then ended up, she was only supposed to be on there temporarily to kind of like, because she had experience and I didn't. Wow. And so she stayed on for a little while and probably stayed on longer than she had expected, but um, in yeah. the end, ended up just teaching me everything and, and left, and then it was in my hands. Wow. And so I was on the project for all in total a couple of years and then the Disney Pixar buyout happened mm-hmm. and uh, the directors were let go the right. you know everybody was being reshuffled again and I just I couldn't really take it and was given this opportunity by again my friend Mike D said to go do Hoodwink 2 and so I left DTS yeah. and went and did, did Hoodwink 2 I was in, the art director on that in a, a bizarre building that again was the most bizarre like in a little like it was like a medical office complex yeah. next to a tire shop and a, you know, a, you know, in Montrose, California. It just it was the most random yeah. place ever. Yeah. Where, you know, we had to buy fans and cut holes in the walls for the server because it kept overheating because it was literally in the closet. 
and just dealt with some bizarro people. Yeah. But um, it's such a strange part of the industry. That whole kind of like you know Indo- realm of the Weinstein. Yeah, and the independent yeah. you know animation mm-hmm. filmmaker um, learned a lot in that process. But yeah, that I mean I think that was my first real true just on my feet on my yeah. own art direction moment yeah. of, of doing it. Thankfully, you know, Mike Disa again was, yeah. was there to, to give me that support and was yeah. fortunate enough to, you know, to be able to go through that and I guess in a way work out a lot of the kinks in yeah. what to do and what not to do. Right. I mean, still still working out those kinks, but that was the first right. initial just pass into it. Yeah. So it was there from, what, 2007, 2009, something like that, or Even eight. later, I think. I don't think so, because I started back at DTS, Disney Tunes, in 2009 on Planes. Oh, okay. Cause, and Hoodwing 2 hadn't come out yet. Right, because that was caught in limbo for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So you left an art direction job at Disney. Right. To go work on an indie feature. I did, yes. Was there right. any sense of overwhelming uncertainty about, like, well, I've become untethered from the big studio, as crazy as it is sometimes, like, and then I went out in the indie world, and then yeah. now what? Was, I mean, as, as Hoodwink was rapping, I mean, was, was there any... I don't think that there was a, a now what, mm-hmm. uh, jumping out into the indie world... Yeah, I mean, there's always a little uncertainty. You're always going to have a little apprehension, anxiety about doing something like that. But, um, you know, I had confidence in, in the director, Mike, and, and um, you know, it was a chance to strike out on my own and do something um, outside of the studio system. In hindsight, you know, was I really ready for it? Probably not, but I think that's where... A great learning experience came from is I just had to learn on the fly and, and do everything on my own. Now that I've been through this process multiple times, I see that it would have been more beneficial if it had been a little more gradual of a process and that I had spent more time as a big studio art director before leaping out because um, I got used to, very used to doing things on my own and processing everything and you know, generating stuff on my own first and then passing it off to artists or doing stuff where it was just a little bit more of, it was a less collaborative process, I guess, in a way. And um, now going back into the big studio system and realizing, especially now the movie that I'm currently on, it has to be very collaborative and my notes can't just be, let me take that back and let me draw over it and do stuff. It's like, here, I need to give you my notes right now in a verbal, concise way that um, is understandable without doing a whole lot of visual right. direction. Is that just so, of the schedule? Or? It's partly the schedule, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, just, yeah, because we have so many people now. I mean, we have the largest art department I've ever had. There's wow. 12, 15 people in VizDev. It's just, it's, you know, it's kind of nuts. So. Wow. Um, keeping a handle on all of that, it's much more of a managerial thing. And I think, you know, I got used to as like hoodwink and then when I was on planes at the beginning for such a long time by myself just doing stuff on my own a little bit more yeah. rather than being collaborative and so it's you know, now it's more of the process of being the manager yeah. and giving the proper direction which to me is the more boring part you know uh, it, it just it, it, yeah, you I'm a, I, I feel more fulfilled when I actually generate artwork um, so I'm, you know, this is part of the leadership learning curve is, is learning how to lead and be fulfilled in that. Wow. Do you ever feel like you have to manage morale as an art director? Do you, do you ever feel like for that's sure. that's on your... Yeah, for sure. Because morale can go up and down right. really quickly if you're not the even keel. It's like, it's all right. And you always just have a structure and a plan for everybody that they feel like someone else is in control and that they're getting, you know, the guidance and that you're there for them if they if they need something. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, every director is in, just production goes up and down and there's, you know, huge swings. And, yeah, you need to be cognizant of that as much as simply just giving proper direction and notes. That's interesting. 
So every once in a while, taking everybody out to lunch and right. having meetings and just being you know, like when you're going around on rounds yeah, or just talking and chatting in the hallways and stuff like that and just making sure they feel engaged and you know, what do you need from us? You know, us as the, they are director of production designers. So what do you need from leadership? How, how do you feel about what's going on? You know, uh, is there anything we can do for you? You know, right. Stuff, so. It seems like, you know, from where I sat, I mean, I, I think you were always really great at that. And I think that was unanimous. Like everyone that I talked to would just be like, you know, Ryan's just such a great art director. Like he's a great painter, but he's a great art director. And that's actually pretty rare. Cool. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. well, it, it, yeah, you're welcome, man. Yeah. And it's true. But, um, something that, that always seemed to me was that there was a point by the time you got to planes where it was like, it almost seemed like you had the official, this ain't my first rodeo badge. Yeah. Like you really seemed just very comfortable. You always seemed comfortable and confident, but like just, there was just a new level of like familiarity and like confidence okay. as to, mm -hmm. despite all the unpredictability of that production, you just kind of knew what to expect. And right. I don't know, it just seemed like there was just something you were just kind of more comfortable in your own art direction skin at that point. Is that yeah. true? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think I've, things have changed since then when like, because up to that point, I don't, it had always been just a solitary position and I had been used to that. Uh, and through the planes, it was just myself. Uh, splitting it into having a more senior production designer or art director and then an art director presents new and different challenges because I've always done things a certain way and the production designer may have to look, no, no, I want to plan it and I'm going to do it this way. So that's kind of, you know, that's another learning process for me right now. I had to balance, you know, it's like, well, I know this way works and it's, it's worked really well this way, but, you know, other people may have other ways of doing it that are just as good or finding ways to be very polite and yeah. encouraging and like, you know, I really think that this would be the best approach to do it. Right. So, planes. Yeah. We need to not overlook the sort of amazing full circle moment that was. And that, that was? You started with, you know, your journey as an artist in right. many ways with an obsession of, about planes. Yeah. And then there you were not just art directing the first movie, but you're basically developing the franchise in a lot Correct. of ways. Correct. Yeah. Uh, from the development phase and then on and mm -hmm. actually making the movie. Yeah. So, yeah, how about that? That was awesome. That was a dream job. <laughs> That's crazy. I mean, that was that was great. Wow. I just yeah, getting to go to just the air shows and yeah. talking to pilots and just getting to be around these airplanes that I had just loved all my life and you know, I'd occasionally been able to go to air shows as a kid every once in a while and then all of a sudden now we're like going all over the place and looking at all these things. It was uh, it's a kid in a candy store, man. I was just like, oh, this is amazing. This is awesome. And then to be part of that whole Cars world and the history and just knowing how big of a brand that is, right. um, it was really cool. Yeah. It, you know, it was really, it was really fun. And it presented all of its, all sorts of new challenges because right. I never, you know, working with vehicles is very different than yeah. human characters or animal characters. And knowing that <laughs> we're going to be doing stuff, you know, where a lot of flying and a lot of you know, being outside and had a sort of plain air look to everything, which was yeah. just really exciting. And just got everything going, and uh, it, was, uh, it was great. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Gorgeous movie. It's right. so, so, I mean, the, the I, development just makes me cry. I actually, I use your, a lot of your best dev paintings for uh, my clouds, whenever I teach clouds. Oh. At this point, right to... Uh, yeah, to oh, oh, yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate. It. I get better at them. I look at them, back at them now. I'm like, eh, 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 eh. the thing you told me. But about I think I found. I think it's more actually. I found shortcuts to right, right. to just speed it up. But I remember the the real pivotal thing for me about that was the idea of clouds being a volume. Yeah. And treating it like a solid form, a solid geometric form. Yes. Yeah. That there's a there's a base. There's six sides to it, basically. Yeah. You know, it's it is it has a, a, a flat bottom to it. It's got you know a lot of volume to it. So it's also clouds are really cool because of just how uh, translucent and they're just they're a, a particle mass. So getting that light to go through, but yet their surfaces also reflect light and bounce right. light, and there's so there's so much to them 
they're really complex uh, forms. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a fun movie. There's a lot of great things that, that turned out uh, that I think um, I'm really proud of. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, in a lot of ways, I feel like it was, um, made, or at least, again, this is just from my observation, but it seemed like it was the most authorial movie of the, all the movies you had worked on up to that point. Like, it seemed like yeah. it was the one where you were, there was the most Ryan there, mm. uh, in terms of the color script seemed to be, it didn't seem to fluctuate that much. It seemed like you had a pretty clear vision from the beginning, and yeah. more or less, it, right. that's Stayed what the was same, on yeah. the screen. Right. And then, obviously, the the characters being planes, that's that's an obvious thing, but even down to like production design, set set design, a lot of the gags and that kind of thing seemed like you were really involved in some of those like sight gags and that like working the cars mm. world. That that cars yeah. world rule of working the plane jokes into Well uh, yeah. I mean a lot of the, the it was nice about working in that and playing in that sandbox is that it's sort of the language of those jokes and those visual right. gags had kind of been worked out with Cars and Cars 2 so you could kind of you know riff off of those and alright this is how they would play this this is how they would do it as far as like the color script and, and set design and stuff like that um, you know, my director and producer were pretty much you know do what you want you know, as long as it stays within this world and you know helps support the story, they were really, really supportive in that in that way. So that I think that's why you know the color script turned out the way it did is because I just had a lot of control over that uh, and a lot less input from the director who just entrusted me to do it. And so I think that's why that came through like as it did. You know. I wonder if it had something to do also with the fact that it seemed like we had a lot of the set pieces, a lot of the really big beats in the movie, established pretty early on. Like there was yeah. going to be this sort of like the sunset flight around the Taj Mahal and moments like that that were kind of there for a long time. A long time. Yeah. And the things that did change were more in the individual scenes, it seemed like, and, and sort of... Yeah, yeah. There's moments. some stories. I mean, there were there were story changes and additional sequences and sequences has dropped out and right. obviously everything. Is, certain things changed and certain color moments changed a little bit. But for the most part, that was nice about that is that the bones of that story and the plot stayed the same yeah. throughout the whole thing. So that you know, I had an early handle on a lot of that. I, I still wish that I had been able to do a color script much, much earlier, uh, just a color theory of it, of the whole movie. Um, I'm finding now, like, a movie I'm on, I just, I did that, and it helps just to plan out even, like, you know, matte painting and stuff, like, because sometimes that, ha matte paintings and things and how the way you plan and build sets can happen before you get into color scripting or before the movie's fully uh, boarded out, and um, that would have been nice to have that as a, a driver. Uh, for that, so on this movie I'm on now, I did a full color theory, and I uh, sort of assign colors to different characters so that we ha we can carry that through continuity-wise, and um, I think that's been hugely you know hugely helpful. And of course now we're kind of reworking some of the story, so some of that's going to change, but uh, the bones of it, will, which is great. So you left Disney, you were developing a movie there, another movie. Yeah, right. And then you left there. Is there anything that you can or want to say about that transitional phase? I think I had, my time there at Disney at the, for that period had run its course. So I had a great help in uh, Allison Mann, one of the best recruiters oh, on the face of the earth, and a, a, a really amazing woman, mom, and, and friend was over at Paramount. And I happened to contact her, and so she was able to uh, bring me over, and I ended up at, at Paramount, We're working with Jeff Turley of Feast oh. fame, and then also, of course, John Carr is the director of Paper Man. And again, and this is very recent history, really. Now, yeah. with, Paramount was not that long ago. No, no. So there's was... still probably all kinds of stuff that you can't say and whatever, but I don't Yeah, know. I don't know if I can even yeah. mention the project or anything yeah. like that, but I was there for a year. Um, and then, unfortunately, the, the project fell through, but got to work with some incredibly talented people oh, and God. some uh, amazing young ta up-and-coming talent and just had a really great time. Uh, my first time actually working with a partner and having Jeff Turley 
you know, be production designer and me sort of stepping back and just being a little bit, you know, the secondary, just the art director and following his lead. So that was a huge, like I had mentioned before, a big learning curve to figure out how to, how do you balance that? How do you work? How do you split up roles? And uh, we were able to sort of learn from each other on, on how, to, how to move forward and make a movie. But yeah, unfortunately that, it would have been, it would have been such a great movie too. It would have been, I know. It, I mean, just it based it's stuff based off of Jeff's art. And I, you know, I learned how to you know work within his style and stuff. And John Carr's storytelling sensibilities and stuff. This it would have been a really good movie. It would have been just so awesome. And just that, you know, I don't know if we would have been able to ultimately pull off the, the the look, but doing a feature that was headed towards that look of Feast or Paper Man. Yeah. But a full feature like that yeah. would have just been killer. Yeah. I just would have been. I, I could have just like dropped the mic and walked out after that right. because yeah. you'd be like, I, I'm never gonna top this again. But right. um, unfortunately, no. yeah, yeah, that was I was there almost almost exactly a year. But again, met a bunch of really great people there, and um, a good friend of mine, Ravi, knew of another friend of his that was had just started as production designer on the movie I'm currently on over at Sony and they were in need of an art director and was kind of in a who's you know type of thing wow are you allowed to yet say what the movie is you're working on at Sony or is that unannounced oh no it's a, the emoji movie okay good we're allowed yeah. to talk about it yes yeah. well there's I assume there's not very many details we're allowed to divulge at all I have no idea. Yeah. I, so we'll I probably safe. should we'll play, play it safe, safe and yeah. just say it's a, it's about the emojis and a texting app yeah. on your phone, and uh, it's a really just fun little adventure of these characters, you know, and in, in a uh, phone. It's an interesting creative challenge in that, similar to the Lego movie or Wreck-It Ralph or whatever, where you have to, you, it's a, just an interesting creative challenge to go, well, how do you make a movie out of that? Yeah, and then you go, well, but, what if all the rules, like, what, what we know as being kind of typical is just not, we don't just, we, that's just not really on the table. And we really start to break the rules of our flesh and blood reality, too. Yeah. You know, we always start out that way of these sort of grandiose artistic vision of we're going to make this something no one's ever seen before, that right. this is, uh, you know, these surreal and very different and, and right. but <laughs> you start that way and you push way far but that always gets reeled back in and, and sometimes it, it's it's good that that happens because as an audience you kind of need to relate a little bit to right. and if it's too if, if your your ideas and your themes and your like let's take inside out if that whole movie had been like the, it was when they're going through abstract thought right. and it was constantly it was like just weird and bizarre and right it, the audience would not have connected with right. that at all, right? We need to have something that we can relate to, that we right. see as appealing, and, and it's not too outside our, our norm of what we're expecting even to see on screen a little bit. So it's fun when that stuff gets put in. Right. You know, and it, sometimes it can work, you know, it's great when indie filmmakers, um, you know, they can be a little bit more artistically, cre right. you know, creative in that way. But when you get to big studio films, there's, you know, marketing involved, there's a whole right. lot of things involved that studios and, 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 no, and ultimately audiences are kind of expecting and that we have it here in the U.S. have an appetite for. There's, there's a lot of, like, say, Japanese animation that's beautiful and, and, and does really well in Japan, but, you know, doesn't have a market here, just simply right. the, the look and the style and right. the stories that they tell. So there, hopefully there'll be some stuff where it'll be like, wow, that's re that was really cool. That yeah. was really neat that right. they, they went there and did that. Yeah. Break the box a little bit. And, you know, we're, we're trying to do some of that just because you have so many different applications on your phone and so many different right. worlds that lie within those applications that you can explore and, and <laughs> make look really cool or, yeah. or weird or, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, you know, as, as an artist, as art director and stuff, we always push for the most outlandish thing we can. Right. Yeah. And then, <laughs> you know. And then we get all upset when they're all oh, they're taking it back. But right. It's part of the process. Yeah, and, right. And, and uh, in the end, it, you know, it, we all kind of complain that these anime moves get watered down and they all kind of look the right. same and stuff. I think, though, that 
that trend is is hopefully changed and stuff a little bit. And there's though there's room for a good dinosaur somewhere or Inside Out or something that's just you know Pixar doing their photo real stuff. You know feature animation, Disney feature animation. You know they're photo real renders, but their characters are much more sort of vinyl toy, right. like a little bit more caricature. There's their lighting and stuff like that's a little bit more uh, playful. Uh -huh. And hopefully then, you know, and then Sony has a history with yeah. their Hotel Transylvania stuff of that super snappy animation, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Gendy type of stuff, you know, we'll have to see where the animation goes. We're not, we're leaning a little bit more realistic in, in ours, but there's room. Yeah. Hopefully that we can, you know, there'll be, you know, cloudy with a chance of meatballs and a yeah. little bit of stylistic stuff that's, uh, yeah. we can, we can interject into there and stuff like that. So looking back at San Jose State, Ryan, uh -huh. what do you wish you'd known then that you know now? Or like advice you would have for your younger self? Be more humble. Ah, uh, interesting. Uh, I think, well, you know, I, I, I was one of the, the sort of the, the top artists that was like in my class. Mm -hmm. And I certainly let it get to my head a little bit and that carried into the, the studio system and stuff. And it's also, I think, part of youth where you just, you think you know everything. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's, don't let your ego get in the way of things. You know, that's, a, that's a, the biggest thing. Go walk into every, like I, I think I said earlier, walk into every studio with your hat in your hands yeah. and, and be humble and be willing and ready to learn. Spend more time outdoors painting, drawing, Probably, yeah, probably spend more time painting, designing, watching movies, probably. Oh wow! Too, I think, um, as we, because it's just you're creating that reference file in your mind of you know different visual languages and different ways of telling stories, different ways of illustrating moments. The more reference, the more different ways you can see stuff done, the better. Even if, you know, it's just like, oh, you know what? I remember this one movie and you don't remember exactly. You right. can go back and just look at it again and, you know, see if that pertains to what yeah. you're doing at the moment. Spend it and, and just spend as much time as you can learning. Right. Just every waking moment, learning, 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 learning. Don't ever give up. Fill up a sketchbook a week, you know, right. just you're, you're still a sponge at that time and you right. can, you know, learn... 3D, learn, you know, 2D, painting, everything, you know, after effects. You never know what's going right. to come into your your, uh, your arsenal later on. They're just like, oh, no, 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 wait, I can do that real quick. Yeah. You know, and that begin, makes you indispensable. As a, an art director who's often in the position of hiring a manager as well, and for the listeners, that just means that you're putting together a crew, essentially. Uh -huh. What is sort of the greatest gift... And I'm not talking about bribes here. Um, right. What is kind of the greatest gift that an artist that you have not met in person, so someone just applying, what okay. is the greatest gift they can give you as someone trying to make a decision about who to hire? Humble attitude. Yeah. You know, to just like be willing to, to know that you. I know that you're going to come in and you're going to sit down and you're going to work your tail. Yeah. And, and that's just that's that's the greatest thing. I mean, the the, the art has to this. The, your your portfolio is going to get your foot in the door, you know, because that's going to be my my first impression of you is what your artwork is like. And so that obviously that is going to have to be just at a certain level. Yeah. It has it has to be there. But coming in for the interview and being, you know, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. I can, um, anything you want yeah I will do that and when you get in and, and you sit down and, and yeah I don't mind doing this I don't mind doing that yeah. I can do it with this so I can I can help you with that I think that's the greatest awesome. gift Welcome, everyone. We're really excited to have you here today to get you a behind the scenes sort of sneak peek at what goes on behind uh, the art cast. We have the whole team here. Um, and I'm Jessie Kate Patterson, a costume design and research specialist. I do lots of little things within Oatly Academy, and I'm here to lead the discussion. And I had a kind of good question that I wanted to ask and sort of start us off with. Um, we talk a lot about a collaboration within the Oatly Academy, and obviously this is an example of a really great collaboration. Um, 
And I find that the conversation often leads into sort of using collaboration to help you accomplish things that maybe are just beyond you, right? Facilitating your ideas or dreams. Um, And the question, though, I want to ask today is how collaboration can allow your dreams to evolve, Mm. to change from what you originally kind of expect them to be, Um, especially considering we have like the art cast where that started off with not necessarily this whole team (laughs) and has slowly changed. (laughs) And so I thought it would be fun to kind of get a glimpse behind you know, how Chris, you know, has seen the show change from him, his own kind of perspective as someone who started it in a different space, as well as sort of, you know, the opinions of all of the rest of the crew. Like, how have your ideas of what you want to do with your life or these opportunities, kind of how's that changed things or kind of influencing each other? Um, so to start off, why don't we just have Chris, why don't you uh, introduce the team members and maybe what they do, and then we can sort of jump into more fun questions. Cool. Yeah. So, well, to, to your first point, Mm -hmm. uh, the show, it's a completely different show now. And I think anyone who's been listening to it for a long time or since the beginning or the folks who go and binge the show, uh, from the beginning will not, that will not come as a shock to them. (laughs) Um, it used to be, me just th- throwing noodles at the wall to see what I'm <laughs> trying. I had, I had video tutorial episodes. I had, uh, my dog walk podcast, <laughs> where I recorder and walk my dog and just stream of consciousness sometimes. And then other times stream of consciousness with just a, a little bit of organization. Uh, that was tricky holding the portable recorder holding also my notes <laughs> and then also walking the dog. <laughs> Cindy yeah, the so, trooper. <laughs> yeah, um, I referred to her as my co-host a few times. Right? Aww. Um, yeah, so, so, and those episodes were fun. I, I think people who like the show still, uh, for the most part, like those older episodes and, and like the, the journey as you're kind of referring to. Uh, Jesse Kate, but um, there are podcasts that have a a perceived high production value that are produced, I think, probably with less people. But the more, yeah, the more that our appreciation for and a, a sort of visceral appreciation for sort of our, our our sort of subconscious appreciation for collaboration and specialization Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, optimization of our time has uh, yeah, has just made the pipeline in a way more complex, but in another way simpler because Mm -hmm. each person's role uh, with the exception perhaps of the people on either end of the pipeline on you and edge you know, is, is, pretty clearly defined Mm. and uh and so yeah we we typically start with well it typically starts with a conversation and sometimes that's a conversation that happens with someone who is not in the room right now sometimes that's a student sometimes it's an experience sometimes it's a a convention or a a a lecture or something you know it could, could be anywhere we get the the idea for an episode or a series uh, from lots of different places. Oftentimes, ideas for episodes emerge while I'm having lunch or coffee. Yeah. Uh, with somebody, uh, a friend um, in the industry or, you know, whatever. Just just lots of different places. And then those ideas get processed. Uh, there's a lot of verbal processing that happens. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, just a a huge part of what we do. It's a huge part of our day to day is just getting on the phone and just talking through stuff. Um, and so that processing happens with, uh, typically Anya, Edge, Micah, uh, Erica, and then really anybody else on the team oftentimes, but, uh, but yeah, but lots of processing that happens with, with, uh, yeah, with Anya, Edge and Micah. And then, um, what happens next? So then there's a point at which it has to become a thing in the, the you know, kind of the, the gears have to start turning. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> and that's th- there is no one who turns gears better <laughs> than <laughs> Anya. And I think everybody on the team knows and, and deeply appreciates that. And so that and that sort of um, you, know, you know her role is we refer to as associate producer or assistant producer mm-hmm. because. That you know, there's this blend of pipeline mechanics of of time management, uh, organization, productivity, that kind of stuff, and the creative. So she's doing both, just like any producer you would meet in animation, and uh, and I'm sure other places too. But you know, I come from animation, and uh, and so yeah, that the gears start turning with her, and that's everything from the personnel, you know, the, the relational aspects with the guests or with other collaborators, people who are going to be on the recording or people who are, are helping out with the recording in some way. And then she, it, that, that transitions to where she starts managing actual production assets, things we make. So that could be the copy for a blog poster. That could be the actual MP3. The, uh, that could be the garage band file that we're mixing or whatever, all the different pieces and parts that that go into making a show. And then meanwhile, we are having lots of conversations about when the heck this show is going to come out. (laughs) Trying to relate that episode to everything else we do at the Academy, which Mm -hmm. is crazy. Like you said, I think Jesse craziness, you know, it is craziness. (laughs) And um, we're working hard to have that be less crazy and have it be more dependable and, and I think in a lot of ways, that's what 2016 has been about uh, yeah. for us as a team. Mm-hmm. For the Artcast, it's been about something else, I think. But, uh, but we can get to that later. But, uh, but in terms of the team, I think really that's, you know, uh, yeah, we're, tr- we're figuring out how to... I think we've always collaborated well. Yeah. But, uh, but really just becoming more efficient and more optimal and tightening up all the logistics to leave lots of room for the personal relationships and mm. trying to get mechanics and logistics. Uh, they can't go away cause you got to make a thing but <laughs> trying to get them out of the way of letting each artist be their own person and letting artists interact in a way that is organic and spontaneous. And, and Anya is um, I've actually whew, hold on. I've actually never worked with anybody that is as good at that, at that as she is, that is as connected to the humane aspects of a production uh, as she is to the logistical aspects of a production. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So that's, so that's Anya not only is many times a catalyst, but she's also, she also sees things through. Um, and then we eventually record an episode and uh, <laughs> that, uh, that happens sometimes. <laughs> So. <laughs> um, we, uh, you know, we record episodes and that can happen via Skype and that can also happen in person. Uh, sometimes we, we, and we're trying to do more of those. In fact, we're trying to do more in-person interviews. Uh, I like, I like the in-person interview. I'm actually interested to hear what the, the editorial team has to say about that, but um, there's something spontaneous about it. Then the raw audio goes to one of our editors and um, we have basically every editor who works at Oatly Academy has edited the art cast at some point. <laughs> Garber, Ellie Medeiros, um, Don Yoakum. Uh, I, I can't remember if RJ Draper has actually edited the art cast, probably, or at least a segment on the art cast. Um, and then there's Kevin Chandler. And Kevin... You know, we, we could have brought any of these editors onto the show, but Kevin has, has edited the, you know, in terms of notches in his belt, has edited the <laughs> most podcasts of anybody. And the, the number, I, I don't even know what the number is. Yeah. Is that Kevin, but, yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Um, and, uh, and so the cool part about, you know, our relationship with Kevin is it's cool in the way that our relationship with Anya is cool in that I think most podcasts are sort of a send this to the editor. Do we have it back from the editor? Those are the two questions, but not when you're working with Kevin Chandler and not when you're working with anyone else who works on the show. 
the editorial, anyone, any good filmmaker understands that in a lot of ways you remake the movie in editing. And in a lot of ways, the movie lives or dies by its editing. And, you know, here we, we realize that this is true for podcasts as well. And yeah, there's, I could say more and more about editorial and that kind of thing. Maybe we'll get to that later, but, but the point <laughs> is, is that having a creative uh, editor, uh, an editor that is as sharp mm. and um, empathetic as Kevin and the other editors we work with are, it, it really, it has really helped the art cast to become something m more, uh, something, you know, far greater than Chris's random thoughts while he walks his dog. <laughs> there's something fun about that. I do. I do. I think there's something fun about that. And I don't mean that in a self-centered way because I'm interested in that really for, from anybody. I'd be interested in just about anyone's dog walk podcast audio journal because that's, it's cool to learn how people think and, and that kind of thing. So not just me, but that there, that's a valid uh, format. But I think the show is good now because of what began with Kevin. Um, and there's a quality, there's a precision in the pipeline even that came from working with Kevin and help, you know, starting to understand how the show gets made. And that's both on the mechanical level and on the creative level. And uh, so, yeah, so Kevin, in a lot of ways, again, lots of phone calls, just hours on the phone or on Skype uh, and with me and with Anya and with, um, uh, you know, other folks that work on the show, just kind of just going, how do we kind of question everything? How do we steal from other industries? How do we uh, create <laughs> something better? You know, how do we, how do we make a, make the show better. And that's something that uh, everybody here actually has in common and, um, and specifically Kevin is they never want it to just be the same. They never just want to go, can we just have a dependable pipeline that we just, you, you know, that's a value, but never at the expense of making the show better. They always are looking for ways to improve it. And, and Kevin is a, an endless fountain of ideas for how to, how to make things better. And uh, yeah, there's just no greater relief than, excuse me, <clears throat> to know that you can send your, you know, loose ideas recorded <laughs> in a frenzy <laughs> while you were, you know, half pre prepared and, and uh, anxious, nervous, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and to know that it's going to come back and be as precise as something Kevin produces is amazing. Mm, so and then uh, the show goes to mixing after that. Um, and that's where Z comes in and, and Z is again, just, a, a you know, Z affects every part of the Academy in, in, you know, lots of different ways through our friendship, through his friendship to, uh, the folks on the team, uh, you know, through his, uh, you know, it, it, I was talking about how ideas get started. A lot of ideas get started with Z conversations with Z, um, and then stuff Z posts in our team Facebook groups and, and that kind of thing. And uh, Z is a ten talent guy. He's he's a musician. He's he knows audio engineering. He knows everything. Um, and uh, and so <laughs> so uh, the show just you know sounds beautiful because he um, he took what Kevin and I were trying to create sort of uh, you know from the audio perspective and uh, and just really punched it up and and um, is starting to now affect. Uh, extend that effect to the other shows we produce, uh, Stories Unbound, DIY Animation, and um, I guess, well, this is a little bit of a tangent. <laughs> the folks I've already mentioned, and then Edge, who, who's next up, we, uh, you know, they've all affected the development of those other shows as well in a significant way. Mm -hmm. um, they've all had a voice in launching elements of each show or the show as a whole or just what, every, every aspect. And, and so of the other podcast hosts, every... Basically, everybody you ever hear who works, who does anything in Oatly Academy affects other things. <laughs> like, that's just the way it goes. So uh, it's hard to keep track of at times, in fact. Um, but yeah, but then the show uh, goes... And then where do you send the actual files, E? How does that happen? Um, I send it to the deliverer of all things, who is Anya. <laughs> <laughs> okay. she, she directs it. 
Okay. <laughs> and then somehow that magically gets onto the website. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I think, Edge, you're implementing that actual, uh, you know, the upload and that kind of thing and all mm-hmm. the logistical stuff, the tagging, the mm-hmm. making sure it's, uh, the feed is correct, making sure that the episode is going to show up in the correct category feed, <laughs> which is uh, no small task given how many shows we have out now and how many shows are in development <laughs> and then also it helps with the actual technical setup of the show and then uh making sure that the post is not that the actual blog post itself is not going to embarrass the oatly academy brand <laughs> um, <laughs> she, uh, she goes and checks errors technical uh metadata errors all that stuff that most people don't even notice because the process becomes invisible if we do our jobs right yeah um and then also the copy and then like i said a lot of ideas are born through conversations with edge and uh i don't know if we call them conversations it's more like collaborative rants um and then uh and then yeah then the show goes out and then finally we actually are in a period of transition now where <laughs> a lot of the pipeline stuff and logistics are actually moving onto your plate just <laughs> as well as the creative. So uh, you're, we're now transitioning in, into this thing where we're kind of, we're going to be figuring it out over the next few months, mm-hmm. but uh, there's this, this uh, role where you're taking a lot of stuff off of Anya's plate, but then there's this also this um, element of, we don't want to create we, we never wanted to create a one-way conversation. And I, I actually think that's mm-hmm. true all the way back to those old ArtCast episodes where it was just me. Um, we never wanted it to be a one, one-way conversation. Never this megaphone where we're shouting into it. <laughs> but rather... Listen to me. <laughs> yeah, rather a conversation, an ongoing conversation with, uh, with, our, with our students, with our audience. And so we needed another you know, creative, intelligent brain on this to, to continue to improve it and make it, uh, you know, do a better job of communicating who we are as a school, who we are as a community and helping people to understand and, and uh, uh, internalize that on an emotional level and just really understand what makes us unique as a school and both on the pedagogical uh, from the pedagogical perspective, also from the uh, creative perspective, also from the logistical perspective, and also from the communal perspective, and to try to tie all those things together and have the truth, kind of the emotional truth and the organizational truth of the Oatly Academy reflected in the show, or shows, should I say. And that's yeah. uh, so we're currently solving that problem <laughs> and to improve that, which is fun. And it's great to have you helping us with that. It's a fun thing to do. That was a beautiful way to describe all of this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. This is what I do. Yes, now I know. <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? It's so easy to just kill someone's spirit by giving them a job title, you know, and, and the implications of the, you know, this sort of like standard in, in implications of job titles. And right. um, although job title we are not opposed to job titles <laughs> it's just that we try to be really careful that they aren't that nobody ever is just kind of shoved into a box and, yeah. mm-hmm. and it sounds like i mean it's like, to yeah yeah I mean, cog the cog mentality <laughs> <laughs> well it just sounds like what you were saying before you said like the the pipeline itself is always open to improvement right you, know, you don't have this thing where you're trying to force it into this eternal formula because that yeah. limits you from kind of going, oh, you know, there's this new strength that we've learned about this person or this new weakness where let's balance that out better. Yeah. And just that constant fluidity. It's the be like water, right? You know, yeah. like you're looking for that balance that allows the most optimum growth, not only within the show or within the knowledge of, of the community as they're learning through what you're sharing, but within the team right. itself. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm glad to be part of it. That kind of brings me to another question that I had kind of jotted down um, when I was just kind of pondering this. Um, and we can go through with the team members now. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts on 
coming into a, a new collaboration like this, you know, we, all of you kind of came, you know, sometimes you changed your role as you were going, but that first initial sort of learning how to collaborate within this sort of Oatly community, Oatly Academy community or Chris Oatly type uh, podcasts, if you had any particular concerns or reservations, I know that a lot of the listeners and myself as well, when I was thinking about collaboration, um, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of worry when you, sort of get used to this Lone Ranger style of working. Um, so often we're alone in our introverted artistic space. And it's a little hard to imagine how you can work in a creative space where you can share your ideas or, or be vulnerable enough when you have a weakness or something that you want to, you know, how can I collaborate better and not feel like that's going to be to the detriment of the show. Um, so why don't we start off with Anya? Um, what what were what was your sort of first thoughts, concerns, things that were going through your head when you first started joining in on this particular process? Um, hey, any here? Uh, yeah, <laughs> great question. So when I first started working with Chris and for the OE Academy, the team wasn't as big as it is right now. So correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but it was just me, you, and Kevin at the beginning. I think so. I am the least reliable when it comes to <laughs> accuracy. <laughs> historical accuracy. Yeah. And, yeah. No, actually, I think I might beat you on that. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when we started, so I came from a different company and the collaboration at that company was, I thought, good because everybody wanted to make good work. But I, I am being honest when I say I could not ever have imagined that a collaboration could be this good without being here and seeing it for myself and experiencing it. And I'm going to explain what I mean in just a second. So when I first started, it was Chris, me, and Kevin. And at the beginning, I was just trying to understand what was going on on a podcast pipeline production because I I had no, I, I didn't even listen to podcasts when I first joined. Like many people joined Chris because they listened to the podcast. I joined Chris because I saw a magazine near to the cookie recipe part of the <laughs> show. And, you know, that happened. And I didn't know what a podcast was. And I'm like, oh, that's a podcast. That's something I think it's cool. Never thought that was possible. Um, so I, yeah, basically I was thrown into the deep end in a good sense. I mean, no one abandoned me like, Hey, figure that out. Uh, that's a, another really good thing about the whole team. They really care about you and they help you as much as, you know, they're there for you, even though we're not on the same physical space. Internet is amazing. And we're talking all of the time. Communication is key. Chris keeps saying that we, and we just like ask all the questions we have. And at the beginning, it wasn't that hard for me. It was just me, Chris, and Kevin, like I just said. So I would help Chris coordinate with the guests to get things moving. And then I would talk to Kevin to get things edited. And Chris took care of everything else. All I had to worry about at the beginning was facilitating communication and scheduling. Hmm. It took me a, a bit of, took me a, some time to actually understand what was the magic happening after the recording. Cause I had no idea what a pre-roll was, you know, an introduction, like the intro, the outro, I had no idea. And as that became more real and the team grew, like Edge came in and Z was the last person getting into the pipeline, if I'm not mistaken. And as the pipeline grew, what I actually realized, and this is a cliche, is how awesome the OE team is because Everybody wants to make a good show and every single person in the pipeline is proactive. So yeah. if I forgot about something, because, you know, the more the team grew, the harder the job was for me because it was more, you know, like when you're juggling balls and people just throw you balls and like, Hey, just keep juggling. <laughs> and instead of three, like, Don't drop anything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was trying to figure it out. Like, okay. And I, I learned like new dynamics. Oh, when I talk to Kevin or whoever is editing the episode, I might want to have an idea about when the edit is going to be ready. So I talk to Z. So I make sure Z has time to mix it and we have time to review it. And, remix it if necessary, which rarely ever happens because it's amazing to get the episode out in time and what else comes in between those parts. So that was hard. And 
I was amazed at how good the team was at taking care of the pipeline themselves if mm. things slipped my mind. I would see Z texting me like, hey, Anya, um, I, I heard or I overheard that you guys are getting um, an episode ready, just making sure you guys need me to mix it. I'm like, oh, my God, Z, thank you so much for asking. I completely forgot to, to, to know. So, yeah, the team is amazing. Everybody is super focused and thinking about what they need to do. So, yeah, that's that's thing. awesome. That's awesome. I, yeah. I might jump out of order real quick. Oh yeah, go ahead, Chris. I was just gonna. I'm I'm interested to know what your experience was like when you. What what did you what? How did your feeling, your emotional reality shift from when you first started to now? Oh, I I actually good question. I actually was looking at my old emails my very first emails and my email on my email inbox from the old academy from when I first started and what I was doing to what I'm doing now Mm. and I was actually pretty mind blown by the growth because I I didn't realize how much I had grown not only in managing a team pipeline wise but also my English skills because English is not my first language how much better it has become Mm. even though you know always we can improve it but moving ahead and so can I yeah <laughs> and, <laughs> wait I had a point sorry oh, oh no no I was just like I had something to say what was it um so not only my English skills but also the way also the way communication works like you can talk for one hour and say something that you could you could have said in three minutes so you're just wasting someone else's 57 minutes and yeah. That has improved a lot over time. And I have learned to trust everybody much more. It's okay. Like we're all humans and no one, if, if, if something happens, a mistake happens, well, it happens. Like no one made it happen on purpose. That's, you know, we're humans. Humans make, some, make, some, make mistakes. And you know, <laughs> I mean, like the other day, I was just talking to Chris about an episode. And I'm like, oh my God, I was listening to the final mix and the pre-roll wasn't there or something. And I didn't hear it. And he didn't, you know, didn't hear it because the pipeline changed because of some factor and the episode was out. I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And Chris is like, I did that tons of times, you know, just <laughs> pre-roll in there and, you know, re-upload. No one will know. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It reminds me. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, the 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 recent collaboration series post, um, the Tales of Three post, and the oh. question actually that Chris brought up, which was, you know, can you remember a time when someone else helped you identify a strength in yourself that you previously could not see? Mm. And that feels like a really good example of that. That you know, not only is it kind of uh, the collaboration helping you notice that you know there was something that you could do that you didn't realize you were capable of, okay. as well as sort of a place where you can actually gain a new skill that you hadn't, you know, realized you were capable of, of gaining. That is so true. And I had never realized, and this is going to sound weird. I had never realized how actually capable, that's the word. See, English, improvements. How capable <laughs> I was with dealing with people and keeping organization consistent. I had never realized that until the team got so big that I yeah. had no choice but to be fully aware of it. Wow. Right. So that was really something that shocked me when the team when the team grew and I'm like, okay, the information I have has been working so far, but it won't keep working like this because now everything's different. So I have to recalibrate and see something else. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I'd love to jump to um, a little out of order, but jump to Z just so for so that he can have a good, you know, time feel comfortable with the amount of time he's got here. Um, why don't you go ahead? It's just same question, sort of like concerns or things that you were thinking when you're first coming in versus how it's sort of evolved as you went through. Sure. Um, you know, I, the first thing I thought when I first joined OA as a, a mix engineer was, and this is a sign of how good the podcast was because I realized, Oh my gosh. You actually have to do all these things. You actually have to <laughs> do it. You actually have to record it in good quality, edit it, mix it. You actually have to take care of a website and a blog post. And um, you know, before I joined the team, 
I was just a podcast listener, you know? Mm. Um, so what's the way, the reason I say it's a good sign for the podcast is because when a listener listens, they don't think about any of that. Mm. They just get right straight to the content, to the material. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, I honestly, I felt right at home. I, I have a, a film background, so it was just like, you know, yeah. You have a shot list, get the shots, mm. edit, then you do color after the editor sound. Yeah. So it was, it's been awesome. That's awesome. Oh, um, how about I'm going to jump over to Edge? Same question. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> yeah, I think mine has, my role has shifted quite a bit <laughs> since. I got here and it was, I think, quite a struggle in the beginning to really, well, okay, so let me rephrase that. I dealt with a lot of anxiety in the first few months that I was working here because I wasn't used to, first of all, being on a team, yeah. <laughs> pretty much used to working solo. So that was an interesting new change. And then I was doing things that I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was capable of doing at the time for example speaking of anxiety <laughs> I, I actually started off more on like the copy side creation mm-hmm. side of things mm-hmm. and oh boy was that stressful for me <laughs> because i just never managed to get a really good hold of it right but at the time we didn't realize that there was there were other places that i could uh, this is gonna sound weird that i could be useful but like (laughs) other places that i was more capable and we were still trying to figure out where everyone fit still really small team and quite frankly there was a lot more that i had to do to you know carry the help carry the team because mm-hmm. I just wanted other people to do that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, my lo- my job was a lot more broad back then. I was like creating posts. I was um, helping Chris. I think we did like one in- or two interviews together at that point. Mm-hmm. I was um, creating copy for the Arcast episodes that were coming out. Um, I was. I don't think I was on site maintenance and stuff like that yet because I was pretty new to that side of things. So it was like very tentative steps. I was like observing Chris, but I wasn't really helping there because I wasn't very helpful at that point um <laughs> <laughs> oh we had also launched OA Live like right after I joined oh god yeah. if anyone yeah, remembers like that, that. <laughs> like, that was, nobody like, wants to remember that <laughs> nobody knows it was, a, it was a it was a great experience for the students I mean they really oh yeah the moment. students yeah. loved it and when <laughs> when we were interacting with the students when okay. the actual thing was happening, oh, that yeah. was great. It was great. <laughs> logistics almost killed us. I mean, it did. That's, so That's how I learned everything I know. Yeah. Yeah, it really strengthened the team, though, because, I mean, yeah. basically, I joined the team and then got thrown into the deep end along with everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> was clearly on there. And, yeah, so that really, like, I guess, tested me and tested the whole team. Mm. Um, but through that, we discovered a lot of things about ourselves and how 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 we operated in certain areas and what our actual strengths was strengths were mm-hmm. and i don't remember when exactly this happened but i think maybe chris you were overwhelmed with like all the stuff you had to do as you you know mm-hmm. when does that ever happen this time <laughs> i doubt it i seriously doubt that story. and this time that was the one exception from the norm <laughs> <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> yeah, Chris was overwhelmed with the amount of approvals he had to do, and I think I ended up having to take one of them. Mm-hmm. And when I came out with my notes, Chris was like, "Oh my gosh, these are good! Like you can do this." <laughs> so... Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't just me; it was everybody. It was like, "Oh my yeah. God, did you see Edge's notes on the?" Yeah, Chris <laughs> called me. You... Or... Yeah, Chris called me right after that email, and he's like, "Honey, did you see that email that Edge just sent? Did you see her notes?" And I'm like, "Right." <laughs> yeah. so apparently i'm good at taking notes and <laughs> reviewing things so that then became the new like the new focus of my job i became mm. more focused on quality control content you know management not really management that's more on your side of things but like yeah content quality control mm-hmm. became the focus of what i was editorial. doing editorial yeah. and editorial in outside of the audio although you you do supervise the editorial process the audio editorial process 
that's sort of where you and Anya blend together. Where Anya mm-hmm. is used to doing more of the organization, but then you start to take over and okay. start to steer that again, the quality and the precision and finding errors and and yeah. um, uh, clarity. Like we, you, one big part of what you do there is clear. Like really making sure that we're clear all the time. Mm-hmm. And if we're not clear. It's like we're sounding an alarm going, you know. <laughs> Because we hate breaking the spell for the listener, or the, yeah. or in the case of our lessons, the student, we mm-hmm. hate, that, hate that when it yeah. you know, out of the spell. Um, and uh, just to jump back real quick, though, since I'm talking now, I don't know how that <laughs> happened, but uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, jump back real quick, you know, I think one thing that you hit on there, Edge, with not doing the copy. We gave you copy to do because you were because you're so articulate. Um, and I, it wasn't so much about capability. It was just about passion. You just weren't really passionate about mm. trying to find that, that breezy kind of rhythm that a good, that, that is good blogging. Right. Really. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, the stress of doing it yeah. wasn't overwhelmed by my love for doing it. Yeah. So. Right. <laughs> Which is definitely true with the tech all the tech oh, stuff yeah. and the and the precision of note of of doing the the post production kind of supervising mm-hmm. the post post production like you do now on and not just podcasts but also our lessons. <laughs> yeah, very true. Because yeah, now that I'm like this is jumping way into the future, well, present. <laughs> but now that I'm doing more tech stuff, I am so much more comfortable and happy. And even though it's like it's still a, a stressful, as if you want to put it that way, right. It's like, I don't feel stressed <laughs> because okay. I'm enjoying it. Not yet. It'll get there. No, but seriously. <laughs> <laughs> there will come a time where I will cry. It will. <laughs> the thing is, I won't notice it because I'm enjoying myself so much. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so anyway, to move back to when we discovered that I was good at doing notes Uh so then we started shifting towards content um quality control for me and then taking copy off my plate which was a huge relief because oh my gosh it just wasn't for me and there were people who are far more skilled in it and far more passionate about doing it that you know and and we actually ended up hiring that out and that's Mm -hmm. note we we credit them on the show but um mara roberts austin light carolyn arcabasio like these these folks um are they're they're amazing copywriters including yeah. and uh yeah they and anya has done a really good job of helping to cast the copywriters according to the character of the show so mm-hmm. austin white is you know such a quir- he has such a quirky kind of cool dad <laughs> like this blend of like of, of like you know, like he still, still has this kind of dad like sense of humor but it's like a cool dad um you know that's like great but then mara is you know has this uh she's really funny but she has this sort of um uh there's this, sort of this old soul quality to what she writes and then of course carolyn takes that like carolyn like starts at old soul and goes into when we need that really you know, emotional kind of really to hit on all fire on all four emotional cylinders and, and really have that kind of, that kind of depth and wisdom reflected in the, um, in the copy and a head, it just a really, a big, you know, kind of a, when that's a significant part of the copy, uh, we'll give those things to Carolyn. It's just awesome. It's really mm-hmm. amazing how they, they run this sort of the full emotional spectrum, uh, that the show runs, the show does all those things too. And mm, yeah. uh, so that's, it's been really great. So it's important that we, sort of yeah. give them a shout out because mm-hmm. they were the solution to the to the copy <laughs> yes so, yeah <laughs> seriously they like, changed my life it was amazing <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah and then i'm not sure like how much you want to go into like the broader my job in the broader sense of things or if we just focus on Artcast. <laughs> why, don't, why don't we jump over to Kevin and then we'll kind of like go back if there's a particular point we want to then expand on. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, Kevin, you can go ahead. Your thoughts, concerns, impressions, all the things that go through your head when you first start a different role. <laughs> oh man. Um, well, fortunately, I think I'm the only one that's had like the same job for the whole uh, tenure, <laughs> and, uh, um, although I've, I've kind of moved around to different shows, and, um, uh, that sort watch of it, thing, Chandler, watch, watch it. it, watch it, stay on target, stay on target. Uh, but, uh, 
<laughs> but um, yeah, I um, um, I've always uh, been an editor, <clears throat> and I guess occasionally a producer. So, um, but I and also like Edge pointed out, with most of us, um, I came in kind of thrown into the deep end, uh, not by anyone's fault. It just <laughs> is how it, how it goes. Um, mm-hmm. I, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it's, the, it's the world's fault. Chris. It's the world's fault. <laughs> when you keep saying right. deep end, like there's a shallow end somewhere. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, Z, that keeps us going, man. <laughs> yeah, we're all it's hoping there. we get there eventually. Um, just yeah. another mile. We're going to show. <laughs> right. Uh, we just keep adding people to see that it's actually for more rowers to get to the <laughs> um, but, uh, we picked them up on driftwood along the way. <laughs> okay, enough, enough analogies. Yeah. Did, we, did we mention that Kevin is an awesome writer? That's, that's what's <laughs> happening right now. Uh, um, but yeah, I, uh, I got a call from Chris uh, a couple of years ago, right before Christmas. And he was like, hey, I need an editor. We just did this awesome interview with like the greatest guest that we could ever have. Would you mind doing it right away? And I was like, <laughs> uh, sure. So, so, um, so yeah, that was, that was the deep end and uh, had to really slow down, but in the best way possible. So um but and I don't I don't even know if Ani was working with mm-hmm. us yet. Um, whoever was, else, yeah. So whoever else was on the team, uh, it was just I Travis Bond at the time. Yeah. Okay, say, yeah. which yeah, I never met him because um, I just worked directly with Chris uh, during that time. But it was really good because during those first few months of us trying to figure stuff out, um, that's exactly what we did. We kind of figured out. Uh, a pipeline and a vocabulary mm-hmm. um, between the two of us, which I think spread further along when when more team members came in, and then you had those same conversations with each member, and so the vocabulary grew and the pipeline narrowed, and, um, has continued to develop. And um, I think, I mean, I'm just kind of repeating what everyone else has said, but uh, I think it's uh, really fascinating and, and valuable to note how uh this team and this company has uh, continued to evolve um with with intentionality but also naturally um because uh chris has been uh very careful in who he brings into the conversations so true. uh with their ideas and also their perspective and their uh positivity and um, creativity and so um yeah it's just it's been fun to uh, again like i said as i like do one show or another and um there's been some that i'm not really on i just kind of listen in and, and give some input here and there um so what to whatever degree i'm involved in it's been encouraging to see how a collaboration can work um so well you know Wow. Speaking of uh, Kevin's sort of, uh, or rather, the may, maybe the multi-purpose role that everybody plays. Kevin's, I'm glad you hit on that, Kevin, because there's oftentimes where we'll get stuck in developing one of our new shows, and uh, we go just go set up a meeting with Kevin. That is so true, and that's all the agenda <laughs> there is. It's like just just get on and Skype go. with Kevin, <laughs> and, and then they come back and they're like, "Oh, I feel so much better. I feel got all this clarity." And I don't know what it is you do there. <laughs> beyond what you did for me with the art cast, but some, there's just this, you're like the, uh, you're like the, um, you know, the wise shaman. I just repeat everything you told me. So. Oh, okay. All right. I see. That's, uh, yeah. that's very generous of you. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing to just go, go talk to, just go talk to Chandler, Dr. Chandler. <laughs> And I just want to add really quick that yeah. I just I just think it's incredible that sometimes we have a whole interview recorded and either it's huge or it's going to be broken down in several parts oh, and we have no idea where to break it. We have no idea what we can take out. And it's just amazing that yeah. we can go to Kevin and 
I, and I, we can also say the same about our other editors. Mm-hmm. And we're just like, hey, we have no idea what to do. Here's like the crude thing, the raw file. I mean, mm-hmm. help us. And just magic. Yeah. It's solved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The thing that, that all of our editors have in common that Kevin gave us a taste for, <laughs> um, is, well, ruined us, quite frankly, <laughs> ruined us for any <laughs> other <laughs> editing <laughs> <content. laughs> And has made it very difficult to edit, to hire editors, in fact. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but, but for all good reason, um, is, is that storytelling. You know, the ability to hold on to what the story is that's, that happened in the, the real interaction with the guest. The, the raw, what we call the raw audio, the unedited, the, the conversation. And Kevin showed us how to, how to do that, really. Um, how to hold on to the life, uh, the, that that sort of through line, that story, the energy of the moment without. So it's in other, in other words, not over editing it, but yeah. but also finding those precise points that we need to have in order to break it into two parts, or yeah. or you know, uh, clarify the story. Right. Yeah, I think there's uh, a lot of. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I I just uh, wanted to touch on one more thing with um you know, we're talking about, I mean, this OA has been around for a few years, but in the grand scheme of things, it still is, you know, a child. It's still very young. We're still figuring out what we're doing. And um, I think a big part of that is the collaboration and learning how to communicate things to each other, um, the timing and the vocabulary of all that. Um, But I, um, I, I watch a lot of movies and uh, I love movies that involve like groundbreaking situations and, you know, the, the eureka moment of the guy running across campus with a brilliant idea, you know, people, <laughs> people staying up all night, you know, working on a project. And um, I can easily say that uh, that actually has been real life with working with OA where it's like, yeah. man, we're, you know, um, I think when we were putting together a backstage pass and, you know, like literally pulling all nighters, you know, and like talk, you know, talking on Skype or on the phone uh, to people in different countries at all hours of the night, being like, mm-hmm. all right, have you gotten this done? Cause I'm about done with this. And, um, yeah. you know, and you, I think when you have a project like this, a project being the entity that is OA, um, when you have a project like this, there are times of uh, joy and times of frustration and times of accomplishment um, but, uh, and times of celebration. Um, but whether it's like a positive or a negative moment, the overarching thing is it's exciting and it's full of life. And um, so it's really, it's unbelievable to be a part of that from kind of from the ground up, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and I feel like we've brought the students and the listeners into that. So it's not just a handful of like five or six people in the background having this amazing experience. We're and having then every, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, then, and then everyone on the outside is like, cool, it's a show. It's like, no, they're part of the process from yeah. start to finish. As an Oatly Academy student, you get access to extended producer's cut versions of most of our podcast interviews. You can hear the entire interview with Ryan Carlson, which includes 40 minutes of extra audio, plus extended interviews with ArtCast favorites like Armand Serrano and Claire Keane when you enroll in any of our self-guided courses. At the time of this recording, we have two available. The Magic Box, where you'll learn to become a digital painting wizard with hundreds of pro workflows, techniques, and time savers demonstrated step by step. And the Storyteller Summit, where you will learn to craft transcendent stories from some of the entertainment industry's best teachers. Learn more about the Magic Box and the Storyteller Summit 
at oatleyacademy.com forward slash courses. Please join us for the continuing 100th episode celebration in the comments section of the episode post at oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash 101. That's 101. Oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash 101. And here's the discussion topic. Whether from the interview with Ryan or from the panel discussion with the OA team, what concept from this episode resonated with you the most and why? Again, come see us at oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash 101 and join the conversation in the comments. Until next time, my friends, stay strong and stay close. The Artcast is a production of the Oatley Academy of Visual Storytelling. I'm Chris Oatley, your host and producer. My assistant producers are Anya Marcos and Ejua Ebenepa. Kevin Chandler edited this episode. Mara Roberts and I wrote the copy. The music is by Storybook Steve and Kangaralian. Find more art and story podcasts designed to help you make a living from your own imagination at oatleyacademy.com forward slash shows. Mm-hmm.